wanted to introduce today a very, very special lady, Lisa Chogyal, an international tourism marketing and product development consultant, specializing in pro-poor, sustainable and responsible tourism, based in Kathmandu for over 45 years. With a background in the private sector, she worked for 25 years as marketing director with Tiger Tops and the Tiger Mountain Group, specializing in wildlife, trekking, adventure, and village tourism in South Asia. She is currently director of the award-winning Tiger Mountain Pokhara Lodge. Since 1992, she has undertaken tourism consultancy roles in Nepal and throughout the Asia-Pacific region, often with TRC Tourism. Clients include governments, tourism boards, development agencies, NGOs, local communities and private sector operators. Lisa is a writer and an editor, regularly publishing books and articles on tourism and conservation and is widely experienced in production liaison for documentary and feature films. Uh, one of the books that she has done, which many of us refer to, is the Insight Guides to Nepal. She serves on a number of pro bono organizations and boards and since 2010 is New Zealand's honorary council to Nepal. She brings to us a view on sustainable and responsible tourism and Tiger Tops has really been one of the organizations that has shown us the way now for more than half a century. So thank you, Lisa, and um, so wonderful to see you here. Thanks, Latika. It's lovely to be here. Um, I remember first meeting you with your parents when they brought you to Tiger Tops. I think you were quite small in those days. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really happy. Thank you for asking me. I'm very happy to talk a little bit about the early, uh, early days of Tiger Tops and the early days of wildlife tourism uh, in Nepal. And I have some slides and, uh, th to share with you. And so let's get going on that. And so Latika, thank you so much for asking me to talk about the early days of Tiger Tops. It seems like a very long time ago. Um, and this is the lodge when it was first built in, um, in the mid 1960s. But I actually left Tiger Tops in um, 1997, although it sort of still feels very much part of my life. And since then, for the last 25 years, I've been working with it as an a consultant all through the Asia Pacific region and we work on um, we, eco to what we don't really like to call ecotourism but sustainable tourism responsible tourism we encourage our clients not to worry too much about the terminology as long as it's the kind of tourism that works for um, that works to enhance conservation and development Prior to that, I was with um, Tiger Tops for nearly 25 years. I first arrived in Nepal in 1974 and uh, went down to Tiger Tops and thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Um, persuaded Jim Edwards to give me a job at that time um, and then stayed with uh, the group for the next 25 years. We had camps. Um, lodges, uh, trekking and adventure um, operations all through the um, um, South Asian region. And I had the lovely job of being uh, in charge of marketing and public relations and quality control, which gave me the opportunity to um, travel around and visit all our operations. And then during the summer months when things were closed, um, I would travel the world of uh, promoting and marketing. So this is the kind of classic image of Tiger Tops, the treetop yes. um, jungle lodge in um, Royal, what was then Royal Chitwan National Park. Actually, Tiger Tops started before the park was um, gazetted. It started when the area was protected as a rhino hunting reserve um, and this is inside as you see the whole lodge was built of natural local materials thatch and wood and river stones on the floor of the central Golgar and that became a feature really of the Tiger Mountain operations 
as we called them, using natural local materials. We had camps, these look pretty scruffy in, in comparison to today's um, elegant eco lodges. We never aspired to deliver luxury in those days, uh, but we did have very high quality guiding. The high, that was how we were able to charge what was then really a serious amount of money was that we had um, very high quality um, of operations and guiding and, and naturalists. So that was really the hallmark of the Tiger Mountain Group. On the edge of Chitwan National Park, we had the Taru Village Lodge, which is actually still there, um, employing local people, local girls you see here, um, and built in the style of the local Taru people, but adapted for um, tourism. We actually had lodges and camps all through South Asia. We had fishing um, and we had uh, lodges in the west of Nepal, as well as in Chitwan. We tended to expand with small, um, small facilities, never more than 20 or 30 rooms and sometimes less. This was our, the last of the projects that we developed at Open 90s, Tiger Mountain Pokhara Lodge, of which um, I'm still an owner um, and is managed by Marcus Cotton um, just outside Pokhara overlooking the Everest, uh, the Annapurna, overlooking the Annapurna region next to a community forest. So more a mountain lodge operation, not so much a wildlife operation. But again, keeping to the same principles of high quality guiding, we have um, bird and butterfly specialists here. And it's the kind of place that people can stay before or after trek or else um, instead of trekking because you're on a ridge top uh, overlooking Machu Puchri and the whole Annapurna range. So I just thought I'd um, I promise not to be too tourism-y, but I did thought, think I would just touch base to remind us all what the basic tenets of what has become to be known as ecotourism, which is really what Tiger Top started in the mid-1960s. But it's the kind of tourism that protects nature and culture, that benefits local people, and that provides interpretation and education. And that, of course, has become you know, quite well known and um, fashionable. It's become um, a, um, a core part of um, poverty reduction using tourism as a tool for development. And that's really where what Tiger Tops pioneered in the whole of Asia, in fact, um, and which is, what, which is my passion and interest and in what I've um, come to be working all over the Asia Pacific region in that sort of area, often working with um, agencies like UNESCO, World Heritage Sites and in protected areas. But these are the kind of principles which I'm sure, I'm sure all of us are very familiar with, but I just thought I would remind, remind us of them because I come at uh, conservation from a very kind of hard-nosed tourism business point of view. And we're often under pressure to justify why tourism and conservation make such a good marriage and we can use tourism as a as a as a means to actually as a mechanism to finance um, conservation which is uh, which is the, a sort of very clever um, combination and includes benefiting local people and local communities so I'm very often working at the local level so going back to the Old days, the beginnings of Tiger Tops, there's a couple of um, your old friends, Latika, Jim Edwards and Chuck McDougall, who were a, a very um, unusual combination, really, of Jim was an energetic entrepreneur, businessman, and Chuck was a very kind of quiet, soft-spoken, um, uncompromising conservationist, actually with a background in um, and as an anthropologist, but very much an academic in his approach. Um, Jim came from Pan Am with a marketing background and he persuaded the previous 
owners of Tiger Tops, the people who um, founded Tiger Tops in the mid-1960s, a couple of Texan oil millionaires who came to the area as tiger hunters. Jim and Chuck also had a hunting company, um, but very soon they realized when they took over the lodge in 1972 that conservation was the way forward in line with many other uh, hunters and turned conservationists. Um, Tiger Tops was there since 1964 and the National Park was only gazetted in 1973. So that's what I mean when we like to say that we really pioneered conservation and tourism. We were lucky, really, and I was lucky. I joined in 1974, but we came upon really a very well-crafted, sexy tourism product. Um, and one of the reasons that it worked so well was Chuck's um, approach, his, his integrity when it came to wildlife tourism. And that combined with Jim's marketing flair um, turned Tiger Tops into really an iconic tourism product for Nepal, as well as um, a leading lodge, uh, wildlife conservation lodge project product for the whole of um, South Asia, way ahead of what was happening even in India in those days. Things have changed now, but that's how it was in the 60s and 70s. One of the things they were very clear about was that tourism had to be controlled. They didn't want big numbers. So expansion took the form of camps and um, new lodges spreading out, spreading benefits through, uh, throughout park areas. We were also lucky. We had this, we had a, the hunting background. This area was famous as for hunting with the, um, Ranas and the Nepal royals bringing viceroys and guests to hunt in, in um, Nepal. Um, and the previous manager, John Copeman, who actually I never met, um, sort of carried on that. He had a very sort of shikar style. Um, the guides carried rifles and you can see the elephant. Um, Mahouts are carrying big staves to ward off the frightening wildlife. Took a very different view to have, he wanted um, the naturalists to be highly skilled, well-trained, understanding wildlife behavior and being able to interpret um, for our guests who came from all over the world, but mainly from the United States in those days. They were the big travelers in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and quite a few from Europe and uh, parts of Asia as well. We had a lease concession inside the National Park. So we had a strong partnership with the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Conservation, which is part of Nepal's Ministry of Forests. Um, and so we worked closely with them and with um, their research monitoring and um, conservation activities. From the tourism point of view, which was my side, 1974, I was living in the first couple of years and then marketing during the summer months when the monsoon closed the lodge and camp operations. Um, so we had to promote really the whole of Nepal in those days. Nobody knew what Nepal was other than Mount Everest and trekking. Um, Jim very soon joined hands with Jimmy Roberts, Mountain Travel, and that's when we started calling it the Tiger Mountain Group. So after we became Tiger Mountain, uh, we were able to offer a whole range of products. During the summer months when Nepal closes down for the monsoon, I would um, travel the world using the free tickets that we got from our Pan Am agency. We represented Pan Am in Nepal and they were very generous with free tickets. So I would go to trade shows and on sales trips, working closely with um, the Nepal, the world travel industry networks, wholesalers, travel agents, um, because that was the way things worked in those days. Everything came through travel agents. When I first started, we didn't have any communication, not 
even to Nepal, let alone actually at the lodge. Communication with the lodge was a, um, a green mail bag that was sent up and down every day. Um, later we got a radio and later still a telephone. But even in Kathmandu, uh, we received our reservations by cable and telex. Probably the younger listeners will have no idea what telex is, but it's very clunky means of communication. But that was our that was our marketing um, strategy. Really, was to get out and make the market, make Tiger Tops well known, have lots of visiting media and fan trips from travel agents and then creating an awareness of what Tiger Tops was so that the general public wanted to visit. And it was a, an iconic and very um, major part of the Nepal product offering in those days. The big secret weapon to all of this really was, was your friend um, Chuck. And um, he lived at the lodge from the early 1970s, which of course gave him a fabulous um, opportunity to monitor and study um, some of the collecting data for some of the longest um, studies that have ever been done, still have ever been done on tiger monitoring and tiger behavior. He published in 1977 his, um, his book, The Face of the Tiger, and I think there are still, even though he died a couple of years ago, sadly, there are still books coming out with uh, some of his academic collaborators. Chuck was amazing. He, um, he was completely dedicated to the science of conservation and he pioneered the whole, what, the, what became the norm for um, counting and monitoring tiger behavior by the innovation of camera tra trapping. He pioneered some of the first um, uh, pressure plate camera traps, which was a means of photographing, and that meant that you could identify the tigers by their facial markings. Um, he worked with partners, uh, with the National Parks Department, of course, with international universities. Um, and that gave the whole Tiger Tops ethos, the sort of no bullshit creed, which Chuck um, preached. But it gave us a very high standing amongst scientific organizations. So we would have a lot of groups from zoos and uh, museums um, and scientific groups. Anti-poaching, of course, in those days was the big issue, as well as creating awareness of the value of conservation amongst local people. And we formed um, an NGO, ITNC, International Trust for Nature Conservation, as the formal body for which to channel um, our philanthropic work, which is still going today. I'm still the vice president of it. So that was really the, but it's really interesting today, even today, all through India and even Sri Lanka and Bhutan, you can find Chuck's influence and the influence of the Tiger Tops naturalist training in many of the beautiful lodges and camps that you've now got all through South Asia. Um, I took my son, who's also in the wildlife lodge business, I took him through India on a trip, um, mainly Madhya Pradesh um, and Rajasthan, and it was amazing. Everywhere we went, we found old friends who had at one time or another worked at Tiger Tops. So we're kind of proud that Tiger Tops set the standards. You might know some of this cast of characters who've all gone on. Some have gone on to really very distinguished careers um, in wildlife. This was taken in, in 1982. And I think it's something that uh, he was able to set standards throughout the whole of South Asia.
Here's a photo of that early camera trap. It was pretty rudimentary, a couple of planks in a, in a shallow um, with a sort of spring thing underneath which activated the camera flash. And this rather overused photo on the top right is um, the iconic first photo that was ever taken by Chuck's camera trapping um, device. This is now, of course, quite very widely used. We also worked closely with Survival Anglia television in those days. And so we had naturalist wildlife crews living at Tiger Tops. Uh, so we were kind of using all the money from tourism to fund all this research and conservation. So it was a very happy, symbiotic relationship, just good business practice, you can say, to be protecting the resource on which your business depends. Rewards leaving to the arrest of poaching was the kind of big thing in those days. Nepal has really successfully um, controlled much of the poaching. We've had some z zero years of poaching for rhinos. And in terms of the tiger, the global tiger initiative, um, we're pretty close to hitting our target of doubling the tiger. I think we're furthest ahead of all the 13 tiger range countries. Um, I had the um, privilege in 2011 in working at, um, for the world, as a World Bank consultant, developing the tiger tourism guidelines for the um, Global Tiger Initiative at their Timpu, part of the Timpu Summit. And of course, Chuck also worked in Bhutan and taught the naturalists, the wildlife department there, how to count their tiger population. I don't really need to get into the issues of um, elephant husbandry and domestic elephants, but suffice it to say that um, Tiger Tops was known as having one of the best elephant stills in South Asia with a um, very high standard of uh, care. And of course, showing um, people how elephants lived and showing wildlife from the back of elephants was um, absolutely the key to our success. Elephants was everybody's favorite. I think it's a real pity today that Nepal and indeed parts of India are lumped in with all the problems and issues of domestic um, elephants, captive elephants. Um, because in many ways, you can argue that Nepal is absolutely best practice in looking after captive elephants. They live in their natural habitat around the edge of um, national parks and protected areas and they just carry um, a few tourists for two a couple of hours, morning and evening, every day. So they're, in terms of the guidelines of looking after captive elephants, Nepal is right up there as best practice. However, uh, I don't think with the uh, level of concern um, and the sort of sound bites, the, you know, it's a complex issue, but the sound bites are such that um, elephant Keeping captive elephants is probably not something that is going to last very much longer. But in our day, it was absolutely the key to our success. We even had baby elephants born in um, captivity, you can see on the right. One of the uh, keys of packaging uh, wildlife tourism, and of course, you know, that tigers were our iconic species along with Mount Everest, but we, we packaged it with a whole lot of other operations with treks and um, mountaineering with mountain travel and Jimmy Roberts. It was our group that pioneered river running in Nepal, training the training all the river guides with, uh, we, we had American um, river rats who came here to train them in the 1970s. Um, mountain travel, Nepal was the first and only um, trekking and mountaineering company for many years. So we remain um, we, we, the combination of wildlife and trekking is something that Nepal is still very well known for and trekking is an extremely serious business started by Colonel Jimmy Roberts to help his Sherpa friends. About a quarter of all tourists coming to Nepal go trekking 
um, about 300,000 people a year, it's serious business and employs lots of Sherpas, all of whom are really suffering in the current climate. We specialized on the photo on the left here of um, buildings made of natural materials that blended into the environment. You can hardly see the tented camp, which was a 24 person operation up on the left. Um, and we devised ways of employing local people by using local boatmen um, and bullet carts and you know, for adapted for tourism, which was both interesting for visitors um, but also provided um, ways that local village people could engage in tourism. And shamelessly, I used to use celebrities for um, marketing and to bring media attention to the lodge. This is Leonardo DiCaprio, who, as you know, went on to become one of the biggest donors for tiger conservation um, in the world, I think I'm right in saying. The first wild tiger that he saw in the wild was in um, Bardia National Park. Here he is on that visit with the um, motley collection of um, Tiger Top's um, Canali staff. We had lots of, um, we had lots of movie stars. We had lots of, uh, in, in especially before the insurgency, it was a really cheap way for us to get ourselves into newspapers all over the world. and. It, that's really the key to wildlife tourism. It's got to be part of the main tourism business. It's not something separate and precious and idealistic in order to work to make money. Um, otherwise, you're not in a situation to benefit anybody, local people, wildlife conservation and nothing. So you've got to be sort of hard nosed about the business aspect of it. Um, and that's where Jim, Jim um, really excelled. This is um, Prince um, Ganendra with Prince Philip on a visit to Nepal in the 1980s. So that we did really well with that, with using that sort of um, high, you know, getting very low cost, um, uh, while let it, getting low cost coverage um, to bring attention to the conservation issues and educated all our guests, even the most sort of ordinary non-wildlife guests were educated with um, slideshows every evening narrated by Chuck, um, as well as guided uh, tours, whether it was uh, walks or river trips or elephant safaris um, or Jeep drives in the protected areas. Well, you know, I grew up with a poster of that tiger on my walls right through my teenage years. And that's what really, I mean, you know, when from age four, you've seen people like Chuck, um, it just catches your imagination. And I knew all of you. And um, so I just, I think that was where it was at. And I think all the meetings with all of you people, Hashim and Joanna and you and um, John Wakefield and, you yeah. know, so yeah, all people. yeah, and your father was very much part of that, wasn't he? He often yes. came to Nepal. Yeah, yes. yes, very much so. So it was fantastic. So, Lisa, one of the worries that everybody's been talking about is now with the effect of the the lockdown. It's, it's worldwide, and we'll probably have to rethink how we plan our travel and how uh, tourism supports conservation. So what do you think is the way forward? What would you recommend for this? I think it's really quite interesting time because I think it makes us realize now how dependent we actually are on tourism to fuel conservation activities and to bring attention to conservation issues. Mm -hmm. In terms of employment, country like Nepal and um, all over South Asia, um, the nations around the park are very dependent on employment um, from tourism, even if it's really quite indirect, um, you know, supplying uh, eggs or vegetables or not necessarily frontline employment. So it seems to me this virus is really value um, how important tourism is as a tool for conservation. And at the, on the other side of the coin, to ensure that all tourism is sustainable and responsible. 
because um, we're just simply not going to be able to carry on like we were before. It's a really, it's a major reset. And in many ways, I'm very optimistic about it. It will be weeding out the less responsible operators. Um, hopefully the good operators will be surviving. Um, and it's a chance to, to really uh, pause and realize what we were doing to nature um, and how we can have a relationship with, between tourism and nature in the future, which is on a rather more sound and responsible level. So have, has uh, government now become more open to looking at alternate technologies, looking at sustainable energy sources, you know, reducing, because I remember a big issue is your taxes on things like solar energy and electric cars. Is all that changing in Nepal now? Are people rethinking this? Well, you mean you're so right, it should be. In fact, in Nepal, we had a budget last week which just increased the taxes on electric vehicles, which we were all very upset about. Um, <laughs> but let's not forget in Nepal, tourism has always been driven by the private sector, not by the government. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, especially responsible, sustainable tourism initiatives are actually very um, strong in Nepal's private sector. Um, it's the in terms of you know heritage conservation as well as wildlife conservation. Um, traditionally, it's the private sector operators who are advocating with the government rather than the other way around. So, with responsible operators showing the way with um, alternative technology, for example, which is really completely mandatory now for any of these operations. We just have to um, accept that that's, that's the only way to go. Way back in the 1970s, um, Tiger Chops had what was then the biggest and the first solar panel, uh, solar technology operation in Nepal. But um, it's now, I think that's just part of, um, of, of responsible tourism all over the world. It's not just in this part of the world. We're realizing that uh, we have to be using alternative technologies. And it's not just the operators, but the market is demanding that. Consumers are demanding that. And as people travel less or sort of readjust their thinking after this period, and we realize we can't just race around and consume madly like we were before, we've actually got the opportunity to really value what we have and to present it as something very precious that needs to be carefully looked after. So I think in many ways it's going to help us confirm that um, that responsible tourism is the only way forward on every level, not just wildlife tourism on every level. Fantastic. Tell us about which are the countries you've been working on and what are some of the really good projects that you've been associated with in South Asia, where tourism helps with conservation. I just had, I've just recently discovered Pakistan, which somewhere that I'd never, you know, although I've lived here since 1974, I've never actually been to Pakistan until a couple of years ago, UNESCO invited me to go to do um, tourism plans for um, some uh, cultural world heritage sites. They recently recognized the Kailasha people, which is in the in KP province in Chitral area of Pakistan. So um, I did a tourism plan for the Kailasha Valley. Um, and uh, at the same time, I went and had a look in, this, uh, in the Punjab area, some of Om uh, um Sharif, some of the World Heritage Sites, of course, um, Taxila. I mean, it's an amazing place, Pakistan, I had no idea. I've also been doing quite a bit with UNESCO in with the um, Buddhist circuits. I'm currently working with World Bank on Lumbini, the birthplace of Buddha in Nepal. Earlier this year, I was in New Zealand working in Stewart Island, which is an island right off the bottom of the bottom end of New Zealand with nothing in between Stewart Island, Rakiura, as it's called in Maori, uh, right between there and Antarctica with fabulous opportunities to, to view wild kiwis, one of the few places that you can be guaranteed to see wild kiwi, kiwi birds in the wild. So, um, been, yeah, all over the place really, as usual. But I, mean, I, just, I don't remember 
how long since I've never been anywhere three months um, since our lockdown in late March in Yes, I'm enjoying it I have to say but it is causing absolute havoc and devastation in the travel industry and we're realizing how Nepal depends so much on on tourism uh, to for the economy and for employment so going back a few years you had the great earthquakes which devastated so much of the country and again impacted on tourism have you uh, seen the the has that been overcome and have you been able to repair some of those amazing sites that you've had uh, which were impacted by the earthquake you know the earthquake was extraordinary because it was huge it was a huge earthquake was extraordinary because it was a huge earthquake i was here actually and and it's a strange thing to say about an earthquake but we were really lucky that we lost so few people uh hardly more than 9000 people were killed throughout the whole country and only about 1500 in the Kathmandu valley because all the preparation and modeling had been um expecting hundreds of thousands potentially to be killed so in i mean it's a strange thing to say about an earthquake and of course t- far too many deaths but um it could have been a lot worse and that was to do with the fact it was on a saturday in the middle of the day in april so people were outdoors and not in their houses or schools or offices which would have caused far greater loss of life again the travel industry responded very um quickly after the earthquake um and compare you know it's easy to criticize the government but actually I think in general they did an amazing job of help building back better as an earthquake reconstruction authority which is still active many of the um world heritage areas actively it's like most kind of normal is to be going from one crisis to another but the people of Nepal are very resilient and quite innovative in the way that they um respond the earthquake was an extraordinary time that the community all came together everybody helped each other and in, if you compare the earthquake to other parts of the world especially um emerging nations parts of the world such as Haiti or Pakistan actually our recovery has been extraordinary in just five years i mean look at christchurch in new zealand there's still the city is still a very strange devastated area so i think um the government and indeed the private sector don't get enough credit for how much work they have done with the people of nepal to sort themselves out after the earthquake it's been pretty impressive fantastic thank you so much lisa it's been an amazing chat and um it's just been it's so lovely to see all those old photographs and reminisce about what's going on and to remember again um what it was that that caught my imagination from when i was four and made me pursue this field till date thank you so much you have to the book a yeah. copy of the book signed by chuck <laughs> oh <wow. laughs> yeah thank you great pleasure lucky can happy to have brought it all alive for you great thank pleasure you. lovely to see you again thank, thank you, you very much thank you not that long ago it was hard to get to access the deep forest 